So please accept. And then we will start this session. So hello and welcome back to the lecture series, Climate Change Through the Lens of an Inter- and Transdisciplinary Project Climate Work. Today, we will engage with the topic of climate change by looking through the lens of art. And I'm already excited personally for today's inputs. For you as students, the chat is all the time activated and available to use. And please do use it for any kinds of comments or questions that you might have. For now, you're all muted and your videos are deactivated. But if we see that we are not too many participants here today, we can activate your microphones and cameras during the discussion session as we did last time. Um, so I think it worked quite well last time that uh, you could type your questions already during um, the lecture to the chat box so that we didn't have to wait uh, a long time and then at the end, when the time is almost over, all the questions came in and then we couldn't um, deal with them anymore. So let's try this again, as we did last time that you start typing your questions and your comments whenever they come to your mind. Um, so you're, you see that we are still trying to figure out what works best in this um, virtual setting and uh, every time we'll try something new. But let's continue now, or my colleague Martin will continue now and he will remind us where our journey ended last time before we continue with this week's topics. Hello, also a very warm welcome from my side. I have the great honor to do a short recap as always, basically. So last time we had four thought-provoking talks dealing with the issue of how to encourage climate action through educational and didactical tools. So we were dealing with the education pillar, so to say, of our climate walk project. In line with our claim to move with this lecture series beyond the academic realm, three of the four talks last time came from members of civil society organizations, actually. So our first speaker last time was Monika Fröhler. She is CEO of the Ban Ki-moon Center, and she gave us a concise overview of where we are currently at with regards to emissions, temperature increases, and the implementation of the Paris Agreement. We then had Jela de Schreiber from the University of Antwerp, who presented his, his method of philosophical dialogue, encouraging young people to think philosophically about climate change and its ethical implications. After the break, we had Valeria Ledochowski from the Donauan National Park, and she presented her work and how they, as national park rangers, use different techniques to bring nature closer um, to national park visitors. And our last speakers then came from WWF, Generation Earth, and that is a youth empowerment program, basically Generation Earth, um, designed to encourage young people to get environmentally active. The speakers also emphasized the important role of community, that it is important to act as a group, not as individuals, to get together and, and fight jointly against the climate crisis. So while last class was all about climate action education and getting people inspired to educate themselves and others, in today's class, we will look at climate change and the climate crisis through an arts and visuals perspective. So in this week's class, we want to focus actually on several things simultaneously. So first we want to raise the question whether and in which form art helps us to tackle climate change. So what role does art, for instance, in nexus with digital technologies play, what potentials and challenges lie in it for communicating and depicting the climate crisis. We will also shed light on the question of how climate change is currently visualized and imagined through visuals. We will also look then in the second part um, of today's class um, at sustainability as an ongoing process. We will have a speaker from the Oikodrom um, Institute and, and how through diverse artistic interventions then also uh, sustainability is all the time um, and can be renegotiated basically. So what makes today um, special somehow is that we will have three live talks actually and one pre-recorded session um, as part of today's second slot. So at the end of our live session today, a little bit before half past eight, um, as, we, as we have always um, had it this way, um, you will get a link leading you to a pre-recorded talk of Christine Sonvilla and Mark Graf, two wildlife photographers 
members. Unfortunately, they are not able to join us today. So um, they have sent us a video, a pre-recorded their pre-recorded talk. And you may then decide on your own um, whether you want to watch the video right after class. So in, in the evening today, basically, or in the course of the next days, we will post the link to the video into the chat. There is also the link already made visible on our Moodle platform. And I will also later on el elaborate a little bit more on the speakers on the pre-recorded talk. Um, but let us let us first focus on our live um, online guest speakers today. And, and with no further ado, I will give the word uh, back to Ria, who will introduce our first guest speaker today. Thank you, Martin. And yes, I'm indeed very happy to introduce our first guest of the day. And she's Dr. Katharina Xellpointner, who is trained in communication, media, and she's an art theorist with a special focus on the crossover media aesthetics, digital technologies, cybernetics of art, and with a long lasting passion of cross-disciplinary thinking and acting. She's head of the department international programs in sustainable developments at the University of Applied Arts in Vienna, which aims to explore and define new forms of future oriented university education in which develops and implements inter and transdisciplinary master's programs in close cooperation with European and non-European universities and organizations. Since December 2020, Katharina is also a Knowledge Association member of the Climate Walk project and we are really happy to have you on board here. So thank you very much for being here and um, for the next 30 minutes, the floor is yours and the microphone as well. Thank you. Thank you, Ria. Thank you, Martin. And thank you, the whole Climate Walk group. I'm very honored to be uh, invited to this lecture uh, series and also, of course, uh, being a, an associate uh, member, expert member of the Climate Walk group. Um, I was invited to talk about uh, uh, some aspects I find important in the, in the um, context of art and climate change. And of course, I decided to do something about digital art and uh, climate topics. I, of course, can only give you a very, very uh, uh, short or brief overview of very selected, very few selected uh, artworks. And um, this is why I chose just a couple of, of uh, topics or, or works I would like to talk about. Uh, and I will show you um, some of them in the uh, context of discussions we've had uh, since a couple of weeks also regarding um, the uh, digital technologies. So let me start immediately because we have only 30 minutes and I uh, will try to stay within this um, time slot. I will share my uh, screen with you. Um, hope this works now. And um, Yeah, okay. So let's start. Do you see the uh, presentation? Yes, okay, great, good. So, um, yes, I, uh, I conceived this lecture uh, in three blocks, in four blocks, uh, um, which are of course connected with each other tightly. And at the end, I hope it will be clear how they are connected to each other. Uh, starting immediately with the first block, Back to Nature. Um, Oswald Wiener, Austrian-Canadian mathematician, artist, writer, cybernetic linguist and restorator, in 1965 published the aesthetically radical novel Die Verbesserung von Mitteleuropa, The Improvement of Central Europe, in which he formulated a linguistic critique of language as a medium of power forming and controlling the mind. 
strongly based on cybernetic thinking, the text also deals with methods and experiments of self-observation, leading to early considerations of artificial intelligence. Thus, in the Appendix A, the bioadapter of this book, Wiener describes a machine-like instrument, the bioadapter, which serves as an interface between the human body and its environment, and which, quote, once the human has done, cannot be taken off anymore. Most simply because once adaptation has begun, he is no longer viable outside the adapter. The latter's content is lost to society because he has departed reality. End of quote. Describing in detail, in detail the technical construction and function of the bioadapter, Wiener invents this weird human nature interface as a kind of cocoon surrounding the human's body, controlled by a number of sensors placed along the contours of the human body, and I'm quoting again here, hugging the latter tightly on all sides, though without touching it, except in the places where well, that would be expected considering gravity. Allegedly, Wiener was inspired by Austrian artist Walter Pichler's work, TV Helmet, which you can see here on the, on the left side, which like many other artistic experiments at that time, through various, um, dealt with more or less utopic visions of expanding the human body and mind through various kinds of media. So this is also why uh, Hausrucker's um, project at that time was called Mind Expander. Such experiments were inspired by and mutually influenced uh, scientific and artistic research and theories on the functioning of the human mind, as well as through personal experiences and collective experiments with the use of chemical substances. In 2008, Austrian artist Katrin Stumreich developed a, one would call it, contemporary version of the bioadapter, adapting it to an alpine, typical Austrian environment. In fact, what she calls an alpine plug-in for Oswald Wiener's bioadapter is a some, somewhat ironic interpretation of the then utopian idea of the merging of the human body with its environment by means of a technical machine. In Stumreich's installation, lying on a medical bed, the user of the bioadapter Alpine experiences, and I quote, acoustic, visual and tactile impressions. The acoustic wave of an audio signal is transferred to the tissues of the body with the help of a tool installed on the bottom side of the bed. End of quote. By twisting Wiener's futuristic idea and theoretical description of a bioadapter cocoon being some kind of ersatz sensual experience into a setting of real sensual experiences mediated through everyday technical devices such as video projection, headphones or massage beds, Stumreich not only provides a rich sensory experience for users, but also makes an important difference visible. While Wiener's bioadapter can be read in the wider context of transhumanistic desires where the error suspectable body can be forgotten in favor of an old times and material conditions surviving mind. Also Wiener here is pretty critical himself. Stumreich's installation thematizes the difficulty to separate the mind from bodily experiences and from a mediated natural environment. In a more recent work, Stumreich again reflects past social and cultural movements and occurrences which were inspired by cybernetic worldviews and transfers them into today's situation. In her work, What Would Kaczynski's Daughter Do from 2016, she, she I quote, reveals a glimpse into the life of Crystal Tesla, daughter of Ted Kaczynski quote end, the latter of who became infamous in the US as the so-called 
Unabomber in the mid-1990s. Consisting of a 12-minute video and five sculptures, the work introduces Crystal Tesla, a figure created by the artist, as a response to issues of surveillance, anonymity and identity in a reality dependent on digital media. The five sculptures, Obella Apparatuses, are handmade by Crystal slash Katrin herself and serve as protective devices against contemporary surveillance technologies. They are partly half-finished status, such as the board weaving textile from copper wires, and their do-it-yourself and makerspace character evokes associations with Arte Bovara and handicraft art, both connected strongly to, to technologies and materials many women artists have been and are using due to their financial opportunities and or due to their holistic and bodily approach to the creation of things. Earthly materials like copper, self-madeness and social and environmental concerns are beautifully brought together in this work, which nevertheless addresses fundamentally important technological issues in the context of digitalization as one of today's grand global challenges. The work was shown, among other places, in the exhibition Cybernetics of the Poor at the Kunsthalle Wien, um, where in the same show, where a recent video interview with Oswald Wiener was exhibited, a work done by Axel Stockburger, where Wiener gives an insight into his view from today on the bioadapter. In another interview from 2014, he commented on the bioadapter already as it follows. I quote, We haven't been able to get rid of the idea that the world is effectively pre-stabilized for life forms like ourselves. I've evolved into this physical world. I know only a tiny part of this physical world, namely the one that is crucial to me or to my being able to continue living. Uh, the one which my organs uh, react, the one I can act on using my motor skills. So the pre-stabilized -stabil relation to reality produced by evolution is already a bioadapter. In these words of a natural scientist, he speaks of a pre-stabilization of our relation to reality, which has been produced by evolution. With this, he, of course, refers to early theories of cybernetics again, which were embedded in a network of mainly Western physicists, mathematicians, psychologists, biologists, neuroscientists, anthropologists, philosophers, communication, computer scientists, programmers, and many more experts who, among other things, came together in the famous Macy conferences in the United States during the 1940s until the 1960s to discuss their theories and projects. In his two hour movie, Das Netz, The Net from 2004, German artist and filmmaker Lutz Dambeck travels through the United States in search of information on the connections of these scientific, artistic and social developments, which were part in the cybernetic circles and conferences. Visiting various players from the network, Dambeck soon ends up with the name Ted Kaczynski, a somewhat central, if controversial, figure in this play. Ted Kaczynski became famous with a manifesto he had published in two big US newspapers, the Washington Post and the New York Times in 1995, contending that modern technological progress will extinguish individual liberty and destroy nature. The former mathematics prodigy and professor Kaczynski blackmailed the two newspapers to publish his text with the title Industrial Society and its Future. In return, he would end his since 1978 enduring mail bombing of university representatives and airline executives, which had brought him the media nickname Una Bomber. Altogether, Kaczynski had killed three and injured 23 people, 
since he could not be captured by the FBI for almost 17 years. What made Kaczynski a lead figure in Dumbeck's movie and what makes the movie and its story so interesting for the context at hand is the de depiction of the schizophrenic disjunction of an idea of nature and technology which builds on the romantic concept of a separation between man and the world around him, between culture, including all technologies, and nature, excluding or including man, depending on from what standpoint uh, point you are uh, uh, watching it. The fact is that Kaczynski finally was discovered and arrested in a cabin in the woods of Montana, where he had lived without electricity or running water since 1971 as a recluse and being self-sufficient. And Kaczynski's Unabomber Manifesto in many ways strikingly resembled the writing of American romantic novelist Henry David Thoreau in his 1854 published book Walden, Life in the Woods, a Bible for the 1968 West Coast back to nature generation who were tightly interweaved and partly overlapping with the generation of computer scientists and internet nerds, then called not nerds, not yet nerds, and starting the internet starting only as the so called ARPANET at that time, and which Dumbeck is highly critically showcasing in his film. Many others since then have clearly demonstrated that how Soros' ideas of a life of, of civilization has influenced Kaczynski's harsh criticism of civilization and its negative effects on man and nature. In the case of Kaczynski, the model back to nature was tightly bound to the killing and severely injuring of members of his own species. So let's turn now to today's art, starting with a topic that has become known to a broader public uh, during the last weeks, I'm sure. Most of you also have heard about it. This statement, which I'm not reading aloud, uh, but maybe you focus on the green underlined part of it. This statement sounds and could be, for instance, from an advertisement for a famous switch watch, namely saying, you never actually own a, a Patek Philippe, you merely look after it for the next generation. But it does not stem from such an advertisement, but it stems from CryptoKitties. CryptoKitties is an NFT based online game where players can breed, collect, buy, and sell animated cats. Each kitty has, has its own and unique DNA, and no two kitties ever are identic. NFTs, or non-fungible tokens, is a blockchain technology on which crypto kitties and many other digital projects and objects are based. Since uniqueness is a crucial feature of the NFT technology, it is no wonder that the global art market has jumped on this technology. At the same time, block time, uh, sorry, at the same time, blockchain technology refers to art as a metaphor for the exclusiveness uh, by calling a work one's own, even if there exist thousands and thousands of indistinguishable digital copies out there. Art, therefore, is an always popular reference system for the promise of an everlasting increase in value through the uniqueness of one made artifact. This economic principle, which has been a privilege of analog artworks only, has now been taken over by the digital realm, strongly supported by art market players, such as auction houses and some galleries. Some of you might have noted that this digital artwork by Mike Winkelmann, also known as Beeple, has been sold on March 11 during an auction at Christie's, at Christie's for almost 70 million US dollars. 
The work consists of 5,000 small digital images Winkelmann has produced during the last 13 years, one a day. I will not discuss the aesthetic or economic worthiness of this piece. Since we know that art enthusiasts and collectors always have been paying unimaginable high prices for originals of Michelangelo, Monet or Picasso. If, uh, uh, if however, never for Gentileschi, Anguissola or Modason Becker. But looking at the miniatures which are hidden in people's a big picture, we discover only masterpieces pieces of digital kitsch, as this one, which at least uh, with its intriguing title is pretending to refer to the pandemic crisis and suggesting brachial answers to this global challenge. Christie's reported that the auction result, I quote, marks the first time a major auction house has offered a digital-only artwork with a non-fungible token as a guarantee for its authenticity, as well as the first time cryptocurrency has been used to pay for an artwork at auction. Beside this obscure and strange understanding of the aesthetics of art, and beside it being proof of the art market's mainly economic condition, this incident, namely the, uh, the auction uh, sale, or sale, this incident has another important dimension which brings us back to the core theme of this lecture series. The energy use of cryptocurrency like Bitcoin, Ethereum and others built uh, on blockchain technologies like NFTs is enormously high and has an immense immensely negative impact on the environment. The processing power which is used to calculate the blockchain links needed for each payment transaction in cryptocurrency, the so-called mining, needs extremely high amounts of processing power due to the fact that the security of the whole blockchain is based on trust, is based on so-called proof-of-work technology, which has to be searching for hashes to make it forgery proof. This search for hashes, which is a, 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 a notion used in, the, um, in this technology, takes each time quite some time and happens permanently and parallelly during every transaction of, of uh, cryptocurrency on the globe. Insider websites such as CryptoArt or Carbon uh, FYI provide sufficiently transparent information on numbers and figures of the power consumption and the CO2 emission of cryptocurrency based on blockchain technologies. However, we can't really imagine figures such as 45.8 tetra watt hours. The energy which all Bitcoin transactions on the globe needed only in 2019, emitting 45,800,000 tons of CO2 in one year. Can we? We know that the intellectual understanding of the climate crisis does not protect us from acting climate hostile, since the transfer from rational knowledge to acting responsible is too much irritated by emotional and irrational elements and ongoings. Multisensory experiences, on the other hand, can integrate intellectual knowledge with emotional consciousness and thus perhaps might allow, allow for more empathic choices in everyday acting. This is where other than blockchain-based digital art has been dealing with since some decades now, using the aesthetics of multimedia technologies to provide such multisensory holistic experiences. Due to the little amount of time we still have, I will limit myself now to showing you four artworks as examples for the aesthetic possibility of how to affect recipients by means of digital art in the context of the climate topic. In his installation Cryptogenesis from 2018, Berlin-based digital artist Michael Saub gives us a figurative impression of the amount of CO2 emission which is produced in blockchain technologies. 
by stacking three layers of each 432 carbon briquettes, the installation impressively demonstrates the amount of hydrocarbon in solid state, which is emitted in one Bitcoin transaction. Imagine the sensations you have when entering the space where, two, where 1,296 briquettes of pure pitch black coal are lying on the floor, illuminated only by dim light projections of the otherwise abstract numbers of kilowatt hours this energy is calculated in. Imagine the smell in this room, the perception of dust on your skin, the impression of weight you get by walking around a mere block of coal. Bobby Rajesh Malotra, um, his, his virtual reality installation with this rather complicated title, Real Oil Price Coaster, Middle East, May 1987 to May 2018, version three, it's version three or version one, there are um, uh, several versions online. This artwork can only be perceived by putting on a VR headset and letting oneself get immersed into a roller coaster ride on the Earl Pr uh, Price curve. So this is what you see and what you hear when you have the, the VR headset on and moving around with this headset, you can move in this oil price developments on the map of the Middle East. The artist calls the users to, I quote, coast along the real oil price index price of Brent oil per barrel from May 1987 to May 2018, feel the price inflation and decline as you ride along the line graph through all major conflict zones in the Middle East of the past 30 years. The weather forecast predicts rough times, he finishes. All the knowledge the user has about the manifold global interests forming the oil price and their complex political interdependencies will not prevent her from getting dizzy and disoriented in this VR world. The kinesthetic sensory experience is so strong that users have to be supported and secured by an assistant to prevent from falling or getting sick. Research has shown that our kinesthetic sensory domain is connected strongly to our empathic abilities. Without sensing movement and position of our body in time and space, we were not able to feel with, for or as somebody else. This is true not only for the other beings like hu human and non-human animals and plants, but also for more abstract conceptions as, for instance, Gaia, Mother Earth, the globe, the blue planet, or the world. So this is the last chapter. I'm introducing two more artworks to you and then we're finished. Um, California-based digital artist Victoria Vesna's long-term project Birdsong Diamond started in 2012 under the lead of evolutionary biologist Charles Taylor with the goal to understand the language of birds. Victoria Vesna states that, I quote, with modern advances in computing, in linguistic analysis, and a, few, a newfound appreciation of how sophisticated other creatures can be, the grammar and perhaps meaning of birdsong seems attainable. End of quote. The inter- and transdisciplinary project, which had a focus on methods of arts-based research, emerged in two manifestations, one of which I'm showing you here. The mobile interactive installation, installation Birds on Mimic is presented as habitat specific and reflects in each different version their respective environment and ecology. At Ars Electronica 2017, the installation was shown in the Deep Space 8K auditorium, challenging the audience to imitate the bird songs, which were played to them within a transparent Perspex hemisphere overhead, which you see on the upper right side, uh, 
A revenant of Hausrucker Co's mind expander from 1967, which you could see in the beginning of my presentation. A movie with animated abstract bird-like creatures and, so and soundscape was shown on the giant screen in the background, involving also the observing audience into an environment where everyone could become a bird, be it by feeling oneself as an individual of the flock, be it by imitating other birds' voices in the glass hemisphere. So I will refrain from sh showing you the video now because I think we are really tough with time. Uh, and go to the next and last um, artwork, um, uh, referring to, to Victoria's piece before, uh, I would like to, uh, to mention that full bodily immersion into a VR reality by means of multimedia installations, addressing multisensory experiences in the audience is one of the possibilities to trigger an individual's empathic emotions. In Birdsong Mimic, this is done by means of particular sound elements, which the participants could listen to coming from loudspeakers, loudspeakers within the glass hemispheres. In Liquid Culture from 2015, the artists Aysen Karo Sharkin and Robertina Sepjanic took one step further and expanded one specific sense of perception through the implantation of hearing devices into the audience's ear, ears. These devices called hydrobuds, and you see them on the left, on the right side below, were little transparent perplex spheres that contain water from the river Trava, filtering the sound. The artists describe the listener's experience as follows. I quote, this sonic experience submerges listeners into an auditive aquatic journey that starts from the depths of the Drava River to the cochlear fluid of each listener, directly with a vial of its own water. These vessels act as immediate physical filters, liquid audio mediators, becoming the last transition of sound before perception. End of quote. Again, we see transparent spheres here as main elements of the artwork. They serve as interfaces between the human body and its environment in order to connect and separate them at the same time. This skin or cocoon, simultaneously dividing and merging the individual with its surrounding world, thus functions as a mediator between the inside and the outside, the me and the you, and so possibly allows for empathic experiences which lead more successful to an environment friendly acting than only rational intellectual arguments can do. Starting with Oswald Wiener's vision of the cocoon as the bioadapter, we end now with a real bioadaptation by means of digital art. Or, as Chakin and Sepjanic put it, I quote, bringing the experiencer into a liquid environment to become part of the app and flow. Thank you. I'm finished. I hope I made it in time. Almost. Um, Thank you very much. I stopped um, the uh, screen sharing now. Is that OK? Mm -hmm. That's OK. Yeah, thank you very much. I'm so stunned always about all these creative ways of how art projects actually manage and how they show everything between bitcoins and uh, crypto kitties and the oil price <laughs> coasters all the way then to liquid cultures. And, and that helps us uh, to understand in a better way what is happening in our own world in that experimental way, I think that is sometimes uh, missing in other um, scientific fields. But let's see what is there in the chat. Are there any questions now for my students? We have, let's say, five minutes for questions still left before we move on. So you can either, I don't know, Martin, does it work that people can turn on their microphones if they want? to ask a question, or if you don't dare to put your microphones on, you can still just write into the chat and ask. Hmm. 
let's see. Have enabled people to switch on their microphones. I mean, they should raise actually their hands first so that we don't have a chaos. But in the meantime, I would, I would have a, a question. I don't see any at this point. I would have the question. I mean, this, this, op this opens up, up you know, um, many different worlds. It seems to me that this kind of like, you know, these approaches within digital art, it's like, it opens up new ways for, you know, for getting affected, so to say, for more direct um, emotional, for, for being, yeah, for being much more affected actually by topics such as mm -hmm. climate change, if you can mm -hmm. use, if you can use these kind of like technologies in a good way. I would also, are there any challenges that you see, any threats that somehow, um, you know, we lose ourselves within these, um, you know, within these digital worlds, you know, getting losing out of sight what is happening around us or are these things primarily positive if they are used, you know, in good ways, whatever that is? Yeah, I think that's, that's with any technology, uh, depending on how, how and what for you're using it. And um, I think uh, that the examples I was showing in the beginning and in the end, uh, the artistic examples, the real artistic examples, not the, not the Winkleman example, uh, that they really um, can um, bring, uh, give us something which makes us uh, uh, not only think about things, but only also feel and sense things. And this is something digital art, of course, due to its multi multimedia condition can do much better or in some ways better than um, analog art could do. On the other hand, of course, it's uh, these possibilities can be dangerous also because every technology can be used for um, for man manipulation. And uh, so it's is any uh, depending on what you're doing with it. <laughs> Thank you. Now we have a question in the chat box. I will read it out loud. It's from Dalila and she asks, could you elaborate more on the artist's response to the CO2 emissions of cryptocurrency? Do you have an example of a critical artwork in those regards? Um. I don't have, I mean, the, the, the artwork by Michael Sauf I showed where he is um, uh, showing this amount of, of carbon, uh, which is emitted by Bitcoin transactions. I think that's a very critical uh, work and is very well showing us what's going on in uh, regard to the environment. And I think, um, yeah, this is, this is, uh, Something I would, and, and at the same time, it's not only critical in terms of intellectual, but it's very, very um, uh, senses oriented and essential piece of art, which is addressing our senses uh, very well. Um, I don't have another example right now. Um, I don't have it in mind, but of course there are, there are many of it. Thank you. And I, at the moment, I don't see any more hands raised up and no more questions in the chat. So I would suggest that we move on to our next lecture as time is running. And I'll hand over to Martin again. Thank you, Katarina, for being here with us. Thank you again. Thanks a lot. Yes, thank you very much. To be honest, I've never thought about the carbon footprint of cr cryptocurrency or things like that. So it was very enlightening. Thank you so much. <laughs> um, on this note, um, I want to introduce our next speaker. Um, a we have a researcher with us today who's specifically focusing on images and imaginations about and related to climate change. That is Dorothea Born. Uh, Dorothea Born is a lecturer at the University of Vienna, Department for Science and Technology Studies. Um, she investigates images and imaginations about climate change through visuals and texts. Further, she is currently coordinating the Open Innovation Impact Lab, Action for Sustainable Futures, which is a cooperation of the Ludwig Boltzmann Gesellschaft and the Angewandte. As part of this lab, different transdisciplinary sustainability projects projects will be funded, projects that also have an artistic focus. And on that note, thank you very much for being here today and we're looking forward to your talk. Yes, um, thank you. Um, thank you for inviting me and also, yeah, I'm really happy and excited to also be part of the Knowledge Association for Climate Walks because 
I think this is a great project and I think this is a great um, lecture series. And um, I have to say in my talk, I will now mainly focus um, on the media. And I think um, Katharina's talk was really interesting that in a sense it provided an answer to my questions or uh, my points that I will raise in the end. So um, I can start sharing my screen with you. Um, so I will talk uh, mainly about communicating and visualizing climate change in the media. Um, so while in Katerina's talk, we had this very artistic and interesting and alternative perspective, now we will more focus on a kind of mainstream perspective. But I think the media, of course, it's a cover term, but the media are very important, um, a very important source of information for people to, to gain knowledge about climate change. So I will firstly talk about how climate change is communicated and visualized in media, because these two are also connected. And then I will talk about dominant and alternative iconographies about climate change and why I think we need new images for a changing climate. Um, but first, I would like to start with a very short participation exercise. Um, and I would just ask you to very briefly think about an image that you associate with climate change and, and type your answers in the chat. Um, Yeah, great. I see some polar bears and glaciers. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Turtle with plastic around its head. Nice. Yeah. Cool. Um, yeah. I will I will come back to this. You can keep on posting your um ideas. And we will come back to this when we talk about um, images um, and iconographies of climate change. But um, first I want to talk about why it's actually so difficult to communicate climate change. As a phenomenon, climate change is super complex. It's inherently complex and there's very complex science behind it. And the problem is that also, this knowledge, the scientific knowledge that is produced about climate change comes from different um, disciplines, which also are sometimes based on different epistemologies and have to um, act with each other. And of course, scientific knowledge production is also generally based on uncertainties. And I think this is a problem um, with the way uh, knowledge about science is often communicated in the media more generally that, um, there's this idea that science produces these true facts um, about the world, but actually um, the, the process of knowledge production is never finished. And so it's, it's normal that there are uncertainties within this process and that um, some things cannot be answered um, yet. Um, and this makes the topic also difficult to communicate in the media where people always look for straight answers and straight facts. Of course, there are also very big distances in time and scale between the causes and effects. So what we're doing now will affect the climate of uh, the climate on Earth in 100 years, um, which also makes it difficult to kind of connect our actions to these causes that still lie in the future. And also when we think of the causes of climate change, as uh, in raising CO2 concentrations, for example, but also in rising global temperatures. You cannot really see this. You cannot really see the um, increasing CO2 concentrations in the atmosphere. And this is another thing that makes it so difficult to communicate climate change. And I will come back to this, these, these invisibility of the causes when I talk more about the visuals. But um, as I said before, the media, of course, a cover term, and we have to look at the specificities of each media when we talk about climate change. But some things, um, some um, so-called media logics make it also difficult to communicate climate change. 
And one is this idea of the journalistic norms that um, they always have to portray both sides of the story, both sides of the um, controversy. And this has led to an overrepresentation of skeptical voices in the media, something that is called balance as bias. So this idea of giving a balanced um, view uh, when there are 99 scientists who actually agree that science, uh, climate change is caused um, by human activities, and then there's one scientist who says, no, I think it's just natural, um, then this scientist is also quoted, and it gives this idea that there's a controversy going on where there's actually a broad scientific consensus. Also, climate change is not a sexy topic. It's, it's kind of this gloom, doom thing um, where we are all going to die and the world is going to end. So it's not a happy topic, which is also which also makes it difficult kind of to, to put into the media. And what we have to bear in mind is that media never just represent facts about anything, about any story. They always give an interpretation of this story, which is called the framing. So all stories in the media are framed in a specific way. And this means that also climate change is always portrayed in a specific way. And there are different stories about climate change. And of course, we must not forget the audiences in the communication process. So of course, communication is not just a unidirectional one-way process where the audience is passive and just taking up whatever comes their way, but the audiences play an active role in the communication process and they can also decide not to listen and not to feel engaged and just, I don't know, switch the channel. So um, this is something else that makes it also difficult to communicate climate change. So Mike Hume, a um, uh, scientist who is a very prominent figure in climate change research and communication says that one of the reasons we disagree about climate change is that we receive these multiple and conflicting messages about climate change and that we interpret them in different ways. Um, so there are no neutral messages about climate change, but um, always these stories are framed in a specific ways. They are always influenced by who tells the stories and with what intentions and how these stories are framed and also how the audiences take up then um, these uh, stories and uh, what is their cultural background. And that's why um, images are so important for climate change communication because images are just powerful. They can raise attention, they can create awareness, they can trigger emotions, they can transcend linguistic barriers if, if we assume that the viewers kind of share the same cultural background and they're also recognizable. So um, visuals are powerful for communicating climate change because they can help to, to make this abstract and complex phenomenon graspable to, they can help to personalize it, to localize it. Um, but um, there's also a problem with visualizing climate change, a problem that is um, also connected to many other environmental issues, is that they are often invisible until it is too late. So the question arises then, how to visualize something that should be prevented. As I said before, the causes of climate change, increasing CO2 temperatures cannot really be seen, they can only be visualized in graphs, but already this is an abstraction. Um, and Julie Doyle, um, puts this in a, in a nice way when she says that the moment climate change can be photographed and the moment it becomes visible as a symptom, it is too late for preventive action. And actually this posed this idea of visual evidence that we have to visualize climate change to bring a proof that climate change is happening was really problematic in the beginning um, of the discussion about climate change. And sadly um, today, <laughs> It is actually it is actually too late. We can actually already see the consequences of climate change. We can take these pictures of um, glaciers that have melted away, um, of islands that are being flooded. So uh, this is yeah, I think also the reason why today we don't talk about climate change um, prevention, but more about climate change mitigation. Um, so. Let's look at the specific qualities of images. 
on the one hand, they, ana they are analogical. So they are this kind of direct representation of the thing that they picked. I wrote, they see, we see what it is. Of course, it is not true, but on a first sight, um, which is also connected to this immediacy of perception, we see the image of the polar bear and we say, this is a polar bear. Um, and then of course, images also have multiple meanings and multiple readings. So there can be multiple interpretations. But another quality is um, the lack of propositional syntax, which means that um, the consequences or the causalities in images are implied rather than really stated. So if we see this image of the polar bear, then we, we kind of think, okay, um, it's really poor because the ice has melted because of climate change. But this is something that is implied through the image. And we come up with these um, connotations and ideas because the polar bear has been established as such a, such a strong and powerful icon for climate change. And another quality of the image is that normally um, images are seen to kind of re as kind of representing reality. So there's this idea that we, we believe what we see. And um, this is also called the, the kind of myth of the photographic truth, because of course, this is not true, but this is highly actually problematic. And I call this the ideological functions of images. So where also Saffron O'Neill, a very important scholar in, in climate change um, visualization says that the whole process of visualization framing is highly, highly ideological because images do not portray an objective reality, but instead they are normative cultural objects communicating a particular way of understanding an issue. So what is really important to keep in mind with images and with visuals is that they are never innocent. They are always um, produced and reproduced and circulated with specific intentions in mind. And thus they enable a specific view on, on the world while they also disable a specific view on the world. They make something visible while they also make something invisible. And thus they have political power because they can create these visual frames and they can produce and reproduce imaginations of climate change as a specific physical, social, or natural phenomenon. Um, so I now want to come back to this exercise that we did in the beginning. There were two more things in the chat. Um, talking about what is uh, an iconography of climate change. So, over time, there are some kind of images that have been used and reused uh, in the media to visualize climate change. And I think you named all of them. Immediately, these images popped up. Um, because, yeah, there is just this already established iconography of climate change. Um, and all these images, they actually are from the first page of Getty Images. Um, when you type in the search term climate change. And I will come back to why I think this is problematic. But they also have been established in a sense as visuals and nectohies because they communicate specific ideas about climate change. They create climate change as a specific issue. For example, it is something that um, pertains uh, polar bears or it is something that is caused by humans, but endangering nature um, or nature and culture. And they create uh, climate change then as a specific phenomenon when nature and culture are separated. Um, so in a sense, they also mean more than they depict. And again, they are also valid only in a specific cultural context. Um, so because um, my research focused on polar bears as icons of climate change. I want to talk a bit more about this. And also, I mean, not surprisingly, they were the first two um, images that also came up in the chat. So I think it's still important to talk about climate uh, polar bears. And what I want to stress is that when we now think about polar bears, we immediately associate them with climate change. It has become such a strong connection that we 
almost cannot separate this um, in our head. But the point is that polar bears were not always associated with climate change, but they needed to be established as icons through a long ongoing process of iconization that happened in, in different media and in different formats. And I want to show here the example of National Geographic, where we had in the beginning, these very anthropomorphized bears, where polar bears were depicted in a very anthropomorphized style, and thus they became this kind of subjects of identification. But interestingly, in all these articles that depict polar bears in this kind of anthropomorphized way, they're, they're not really associated with climate change. Yet this, this first phase of this process of iconization is really important because they become these subjects of identification because they appear as almost, yeah, human-like and they have this funny attitude and they, they, yeah, they're like these mother bears cuddling with the babies. And then in a second phase, these bears are connected to the Arctic environment. So the polar bears are shown in connection to the larger Arctic environment. And so then in the next step, this Arctic environment is described as endangered by climate change. And then polar bears become these symbols for climate change. And what you can see here is that the, the way they are depicted changes from close-up shots to the polar bears being depicted from further away where they somehow become one with the arctic landscape where they become uh, a symbol for this arctic landscape that is endangered by climate change and this also is connected um, to specific um, uh, political context in the u.s where actually uh, environmental um, groups wanted to petition the government to put polar bears on a list of endangered species. And they wanted to do that to get the Bush administration to kind of uh, talk about climate change and get climate change on the political agenda because the rationale was that, yeah, if we say polar bears are endangered because of climate change, then climate change somehow becomes this real thing. And um, this is connected to all these um, also, other campaigns that happened around that time, for example, Al Gore's movie, An Inconvenient Truth, where there were also polar bears in it. And later, Coca-Cola and the animated polar bears, they took up um, this anthropomorphic um, yeah, meaning and, and also made a campaign together with the World Wide Fund and so on. So there are a lot of examples where polar bears feature as icons for climate change. But what's important to keep in mind that is when we look back in the 1980s, for example, there is a movie actually also done by National Geographic where polar bears are portrayed really as fierce beasts, as dangerous, and not at all um, these poor and cuddly polar bears that need to be protected. Um, so of course, the icon of the polar bear is powerful. And that's the reason why it's still used. I mean, just recently, the Wiener Linen, the uh, public transport um, agency in Vienna, they had this poster with polar bears promoting the use of public transport. Um, so yeah, it, it's recognizable, it creates awareness. And of course it has this emotional appeal because these bears are cute and we, we kind of identify that with them. But I want to argue that on the other hand, they also make things invisible. They make other animals invisible that live in the Arctic and are also endangered. For example, Arctic grill, which is really, really important for the ecosystem, but nobody talks about Arctic grill, <laughs> maybe because it's not cute. <laughs> but also humans that live in these regions and are endangered by climate change. And also because it connects climate change with the Arctic, which is so far away from like, Western European perspectives, it also renders climate change this kind of far away problem. And it has this wear out effect. So many people say that they're already kind of fed up with seeing yet another polar bear. And in some contexts, polar bears are even associated with climate change skepticism. Um, so one thing I want to argue is that we need alternative iconographies for climate change. 
And I want to take up one example here, which is an organization called Climate Visuals, which is part of Climate Outreach, a UK-based NGO that focuses on communicating climate change. And what Climate Visuals did is that they formulated those seven principles for communicating climate change, which you see here. So to show real people, to tell new stories, to show the causes, but at the scale, to show emotionally powerful impacts, but also be careful with emotions to understand the audience and to be to show local impacts and be careful with protest imagery. And I think especially this last um, point is also interesting because this is already um, culturally specific for the UK. So I think in in Austria, for example, we wouldn't we would be much less um, worried about um, protest imagery. And what they also have um, is that they have this huge um, database where they kind of really trying to do this. They really trying to establish this alternative iconography and uh, these principles, they created them also based on audience reception studies. And I just want to show you some images of this alternative iconography that you can find in this image database. And um, yeah, it's, it's nice that actually some of my students are here also in this lecture where I did this exercise with to kind of group this kind of established iconography and this alternative iconography and to look at how these images are different. And um, what they said and what I want to pick up here now is that we do not understand these images as easily as we understand the other images because they have not been established in the same way. So of course, establishing an alternative iconography also is work that we need to do. And that's why I think also such image databases, as Getty images are so problematic because you go there, you type in your search terms and you pick one of the five polar bears that appears on the first page and it's yet another polar bear. And I think, um, this is really yeah, a powerful tool to kind of streamline an iconography also, or also maybe to open it up. Um, so what I want to point out is that images create imaginations of climate change as a specific phenomenon uh, or also a specific problem. Is it just a natural problem or is it also a social problem? Is it a political problem, an economical problem? And what kind of um, ideas of nature are contained in these imaginations? And of course, these imaginations about what kind of phenomenon climate change is are then linked to what kind of solutions we can imagine for the issue. So I want to conclude um, with just some few recommendations for new images for changing climate. So first of all, I think we should really reconsider this dominant visual framings and um, yeah, think about alternative iconographies um, of new images that we could associate with climate change and new ways to visualize climate change. And this is where I said that Katharina's talk is really in a sense, the answer to my talk, because I think, um, she already showed some nice examples how this can be done. But I also think it's important to make the multiplicity and complexity of climate change explicit, that it's not just a social or natural phenomenon, but that it is both. And this is related to the next point where I think that we should also try to show nature and culture as entangled and not opposed to kind of overcome this nature culture dichotomy that is often implicitly present in all these images. And I think, it would also be really important to make the causes of climate change visible, but not just by showing smokestacks, but, but by showing really also the larger um, economic factors behind climate change. And finally, I think it's really important to also engage the public in finding new narratives about climate change, because often um, this is kind of a top-down process where we say, okay, we want to visualize climate change. Yeah, what images should we take? And this is why I think um, also this uh, climate outreach project was so interesting because they really also asked the audience what they want to see. But in this context, I think it's also important to um, 
to be really to go really local and ask local audiences about local impacts and what kind of images they associate with climate change. Yes, thank you, and I'm looking forward to your questions. Thank you very much, Dorothea. Thank you so much. Are there already um, questions? Let's see. At least in the course of the Climate Work Project, we had, um, try we we attempt to establish some kind of like alternative iconographies. At, at, at least it's an attempt. I mean, then the question is, you know, who has the power to establish certain you know icons? And I mean, depends. <laughs> Let's see. I will also enable people to. Maybe in the meantime, in your in your own research, this process of iconization of, of polar bears, do you know, are there any actors that from them on, you know, the, the whole process started? Like who, who has, is there a who that has established, you know, polar bears as icons? Because this is just out of curiosity. Yeah, so the Environmental Protection Agency really played an important role in the US because they really had this idea of, okay, how can we get this government uh, who says that climate change doesn't exist to mm -hmm. somehow acknowledge that it exists. And they had this huge campaign where they yeah, asked children to send pictures of polar browning polar bears to the president and so on. So I think it has to be understood in, in this kind of context. Okay. Um, so, uh, yeah. Yeah, I mean, of course, it is always the question where um, such ideas start and how they are picked up and then reproduced. And I think, for example, what I try to show with, with my research and this process of iconization thing is that if polar bears had had this kind of cuddly, nice quality, if there were some really horrible beasts like, I don't know, alligators, then it wouldn't be possible to establish them in the same way as icons for climate change because you need this um, identification thing. Yes, thank you. There is a, from Daniela Billing a question. Daniela, you can, you can just switch on your microphone. Okay, yeah. Can you hear me? Yes, we can hear you. Oh, perfect. Yeah, my question was actually linked to yours. I was wondering whether like in other parts of the world, like you mentioned Germany, uh, Austria and the US, in other parts of the world, like the global south, did they have other icon pictures or was it always the polar bear worldwide? Do you know something about this? I mean, um, I don't... I don't know anything about this in particular because I haven't looked really at this, but already when we look at um, Germany and, and the US, we see a difference in how polar bears are used as icons. So I'm pretty sure that in other parts of the world, um, other icons em emerge. And um, But the question is always, what is then a dominant visual framing? And when we have such worldwide image databases like Getty images, for example, then uh, yeah, it becomes problematic because it's kind of a streamlining and it becomes so generic. Thank you. There are some questions now coming in in the chat. Uh, the first question was, and I'm just going to read this one out loud. Do you have any examples of photographers who did succeed in developing new narratives? I mean, you can you can look at the at the climate outreach um, and climate visuals page because they also have specific projects. And what is interesting, they actually had a specific Getty Images campaign. So what they're doing is kind of trying to get Getty Images to change the algorithms so that also their images come up in this database. So I think this is actually a, a cool and um, interesting strategy. Um, yeah, um, or yeah, I think, I mean, I think it is changing a bit. And uh, the question is then always, 
where we see changes first and when they end up really in mainstream media, for example. But um, I don't know. I, I also investigated popular science magazines. And I think, for example, in GEO, um, and if you have like a photo story in GEO that's pretty successful, I mean, it's a German magazine, but still there were already some, yeah, some different, yeah, visual styles, like photographing people at the spot where the houses used to be and um, the houses are gone because um, uh, of flooding and rising sea levels and things like that. Um, but yeah, look at the, I mean, I will send, send you my slides anyways, and you can look at this um, climate visuals database because I think it's interesting. Yes, thank you. There is another question. Do you think a Greta Thunberg icon is useful for the cause or not? Well, I guess for the cause of climate change and not for the causes of climate change. Mm -hmm. uh, um, I think, yeah, I'm not sure, actually. I, I see this a bit problematic because, um, yes, of course, she kind of started a global movement and that was a pretty cool thing but there are loads of people who are involved in this movement and i think she herself is also not quite comfortable with the fact that always it's her face and not the face of some other really cool and important activists um and um yeah the way the reason because um this is so interesting is because then again it's a face that we can identify with and it again has to do with media logics <clears throat> so i think it's kind of falling into the same trap as with the polar bear just <laughs> i don't want to <laughs> don't want to compare <laughs> greater to back to a polar bear but um it's this kind of same logic that we need a person to identify with or an animal to identify with so i think it's not really a solution <laughs> Okay, and then there is another question. I think this ties in with that a little bit because what do you think about storytelling in this context? Because it's quite powerful. It's a quite powerful tool to communicate, but maybe faces the same problem. Do, you, do we need these kind of like icons, you know, these kind of like figures and visuals somehow? That is just something I have added now, <laughs> but yeah. Maybe the person could specify what they mean with uh, storytelling. Because I'm I'm not quite. Does it do they mean visual storytelling? Probably, like maybe uh, Leah. Yes, she meant visual storytelling. That's what she yeah. said in the chat. Yeah. No, I think that's actually powerful, and I think that's actually cool because. I think we maybe also need to move away from this idea that there's only one image that can visualize something, especially because climate change is so complex. And so this kind of storytelling, maybe showing, um, I don't know, the process of uh, palm oil plantations and how they are built and how the rainforest is eroded and how they then everything looks the same. I just saw a very interesting um, kind of visual story about this. So in a way, kind of showing uh, consecutive images that belong together would be, I think, a cool idea to actually be able to tell a bit more um, and a bit more complex stories. Yes, thank you. If you, st if you. if you stay with us for the whole session and also if you watch the pre-recorded session, it will be about visual storytelling about rewilding approaches, about reintroducing bears, wolves, and lynx, like with a very differentiated picture. And I think this, this very much ties in with what you've just said. Um, and then there is one last question I see so far um, from Fiorella. As you said, climate change is not a sexy topic. How can media organizations change this? Or do we need a change in society? Because many news media writes that resonates with their audience. <laughs> I think we need a change in society, generally. <laughs> um, but um, yeah, I mean, I think there are also positive stories about climate change in the sense that um, there are also organizations that try to do something about it, that try to do, yeah, that try to make local impacts, but also global impacts. And maybe it would also be, 
good to kind of give these maybe more grassroots um, projects a voice in the media and uh, show what they are doing, like climate walks, for example. <laughs> um, because I think um, this could also kind of um, link the topic to maybe a more optimistic um, yeah, theme, even though we have every right to be pessimistic. <laughs> Yes, thank you. Are there any further questions before we, we get on and move into a well-deserved break? I have a comment. I have our next guest already here. She arrived here at the University uh, of Vienna. So after the break, we will I will introduce her. Yeah. Hello. Uh, in case you go, are going to listen, I will be very happy to tell you what I would like to tell. And my title is Ars Vivendi how to live uh, the sustainability question. And I will do it in a very international, for I'm working in China, in many Islamic countries, uh, in Latin America, Europe. So yes, welcome. Yeah. Thank you very much. That was very, a very good advertisement to, to stay with us over the break. And on that note, if there are no further questions, thank you very much, Dorothea, for being here. Thank you very much for your stunning talk and, and, and see you soon. And we will do a, a little longer break in this case and we'll reconvene at um, half past six at 18.30 with our next guest speaker. Still Sorry, then. Martin, did uh, Katarina still have uh, her hand up or was that by accident? No, no, I, I would have one last comment if, 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 if we have the time. Uh, thanks, Dora, for this really amazing talk and I absolutely agree. Uh, and, this, and and I think it's very, very nicely uh, you've shown, shown us what the problems are. I would like to add uh, that what I see here, that the problem is the iconization itself. Mm -hmm. uh, as long as we stay within this iconization of, 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 of pictures of, of problematic issues, I think we won't get ahead because um, people, of course, uh, get used to the icons. They get bored by the icons, no matter if it's a polar bear or it may be, maybe if it's a new icon. Uh, uh, but I think after some while, people are just fed up and they are not really touched by it. Uh, this is, of course, uh, referring to what I've, what I've tried to say before, that I think uh, uh, it's important to get people really with all the senses involved in these problems. And the climate walk itself is a wonderful project for that. And I think if you all would have the, uh, uh, would get the possibility to involve as many as possible people who are not yet really convinced by the, by the uh, climate change um, uh, issue, this would really uh, uh, be possible to make a, a big impact. Because as I've said before, the, just the intellectual, the intellectual knowing we all have, you know, beside those who, who who, uh, the, who uh, don't believe in climate change, but those who know it's, it, there, there is this climate crisis, they all, we all know about it, but still we don't do too little to change it in our individual and in our social uh, life. So maybe the iconization itself is the problem. <laughs> it's just a comment in the end. Yeah, no, I, I agree. And also the focus on the visual. That's why I think the, this project that you uh, presented was so interesting because it's really about sensing climate change and kind of feeling empathy and, and getting a new yeah, um, perception uh, and experience of climate change. And I think this is really something that, yeah, that we should give more um, impact and voice, yeah. And I also have to say, I'm really sorry, but I have to leave um, because um, I, I have two small kids and I have to get them to bed. <laughs> but thank you very, very much. And um, yeah, I will try to uh, watch the recordings of this session. Thank you. Have a good evening. Okay. Perfect. Thank you. Thank you. I'm sorry. I'm so sorry. Sorry for having overlooked you, Katarina. I didn't see your hand. So let let's get let's get into the break and and we'll see each other again on half past six.
Okay, welcome back from the break, everyone. And we will continue with our third lecture this evening. And this time we have Dr. Heidi Dumreiche here, the founding director of Eukotrom. Um, Hello. And I'm really happy that we are here for the first time in the same room with an, with an actual lecture. So until now, <laughs> everyone has been on the screen and I'm the fortunate one that I have someone here in the same room physically with me. Uh, but let me first introduce you to our guest here. So, yes. yeah. Mm. <laughs> so, her name is Dr. Heidi Dumreiche, and she's a linguist and the founder of Oikotrom. Um, and Oikotrom is a private research institute that was founded in 1994. Their goal is to open spaces and opportunities in creating sustainable futures. They empower human actors through participatory processes, starting from local real life situations. In a multicultural research network, they use trans and interdisciplinary approaches to generate these theses and theories and connect scientific and non-scientific knowledge with each other. So Oikotrom carries out and coordinates several wonderful projects such as Agora Thank you. <laughs> or the Zukunftskaravane. The late, la later project aims to explore new ways to discuss and promote sustainable development goals. The Agenda 2030 with dwellers living in Austrian cities and communities through artistic interventions. All of their projects are inspired by a transdisciplinary and participatory approach and based on an understanding and sustainability as a process, as something that needs to be negotiated publicly. So welcome. And now the next Hello. 30 minutes are yours. And let's see, Martin will be the one who is sharing the slides. So we are here starting the screen sharing and let's hope this works. Yeah, so I'm very glad that I'm invited to present our work. Uh, we will soon soon have a big jubilee because it will be 30 years that we have been working. And when we started, I don't think that there were many people uh, reflecting about sustainability. And uh, from the very beginning, it was an interdisciplinary, as you just said. Uh, so we, we said, yes, it's important to have many disciplines, just like life, also sustainability, which is Ars Vivendi. So that is why I took uh, this title, Ars Vivendi, how to live in a sustainability-oriented way. I don't think anyone is able to actually live sustainably, but so we are always speaking about sustainability-oriented ways uh, for life. And uh, on the one hand, I'm working with Bettina Kolb, who is teaching hermeneutical interpretation of photo interviews with dwellers in cities. And uh, we have developed uh, several theses concerning the sustainable city uh, and its future. And uh, the two uh, theses uh, that I will refer to is the one, the first one is a city as a stage, Stadt als Bühne. Um, which we started uh, in Austria and our interpretation is always we make photo interviews uh, and I myself has a formation as a linguist uh, so I'm going into the text and uh, uh, we start from very simple looking sentences just one sentence maybe and then we sit for a month to see what could this person actually have said? And we do not make interviews with science people, but with people from the street. So we go in the street and see who might be looking or who has time, and we interview this person. And right now, um, Alcodrom is working in Kyrigem. This is an arrival place in Brussels, so the capital of Europe in a way, uh, but it's really a place um, uh, that is uh, sad because uh, it's a lot of newcomers who do not speak the language and uh, it's a highly complex situation. And uh, there I was interviewing uh, a young man who was selling uh, Arabic uh, sweets. 
and I asked him uh, what he would think that could be supportive for this kind of sustainability oriented life that we are, let's say, dreaming of and that we're also trying uh, to understand. And he was saying uh, that uh, we should create, maybe we should think about something like a school. Uh, I don't like this type of school, but I will show you this idea. So I'm always thinking about buildings uh, to have uh, a place uh, that you can show and where people can meet. So Stadt als Bühne is also about places. Where is it that uh, people are living and how uh, can the environment influence their life and also give them incentives about how to change the life is necessary. So um, uh, we, uh, we also work in small villages and we have a long history, you can look them up. Uh, right now we are in Kyrgyzstan, as I said, but I'm also working a lot in China, in Chinese villages, but also in big cities. And we always uh, have partners. So it's not me, the Austrian who goes to China to see what's there, but it's me and Lui Hungi, my friend who is an architect, and we together go and have a look what uh, would we have to change and what would we have to maintain for instance, in the Villa Dorco. And we, all, we always have a parallel study in Austria. This time uh, we were choosing also a village, uh, Grundlsee, and uh, both villages are very near to a lake. So we try to find uh, places that have a similar identity uh, where some of the topics are the same and some of them, of course, are very different. And the image that you see now on the screen uh, is uh, comes from Czechia and it's the bark beetle. It's a beetle um, that um, is, let's, it's destroying uh, kilo, kilometers and kilometers of wood and forest. Uh, but uh, Ganael, who is the filmmaker about this uh, beetle, says it's not the beetle that is um, bad, uh, what we would think. Uh, no, it's people who erroneously had put just the same kinds of trees uh, in a region of five kilometers so that this beetle can have um, uh, a good life, let's say. And that is good. So we come this better. Next slide. Please, Next Martin. slide, please. Ah, Martin, yes. Yeah, for me, it's not a coincidence that uh, today it's Earth Day and that 175 countries uh, have uh, established this day as an important day. And uh, so we are really in an international, inter-global community uh, that, uh, and uh, also I hope that some of the participants also represent the different countries, which is a big aim that I'm having. So uh, what is missing here is Latin America, uh, but uh, we even have been working also uh, in Northern and Southern Latin America. I have uh, a friend who is speaking Guarani and in Indian language and uh, friends in Mexico. And there too, we see what kind of approaches uh, do people have and that we can be basic, based on. So yes, it's culture, yes, it's religion, yes, uh, uh, it's art. And uh, art is a way in which uh, understanding is also emotional. So I would like, maybe we can go to the next slide, please. So that's just the content, uh, but I will be very short. So I will speak about Syntopia. Uh, which is uh, something like a life school, a place where you could work. And then we are showing films. Uh, Brood and Parasite, for instance, is a film about this beetle. Uh, Im Anfang war der Blick is a film that, that I participated in, and it was uh, a real great filmmaker, Buddy Mink. And we ended up uh, at the big festival uh, with that film, which was based on research, uh, but is uh, um, a cultural and artistic, a highly artistic way of dealing with the same uh, question. So we always look into emotional uh, cooperation. And uh, then we go to China with Qigong, which is also an art, uh, but a Chinese art, and also the art of sword uh, fighting. Um, then uh, I will show you uh, an Austrian artist. Uh, and here too, uh, it's uh, for us, why does an artist start cooking? 
so we had uh, several events with uh, this woman who has a technological and uh, also uh, a cooking experience. Uh, she's using the old solar uh, streams from uh, the roofs so that are not used anymore. So she's also using the shares. She's using things that no one is needing, needing anymore. And with that, she's collecting the sun uh, and the heat and she can cook. So when we go, for instance, sometimes also to schools, uh, on the one hand, uh, it's interesting for technically oriented uh, women and boys uh, who want to know how you can actually cook in such a situation. So it's not about making a whole house or architecture. It's uh, that uh, you can just cook uh, in a nice event. We make also events uh, in parks, for instance, and then people can actually see, yes, it's possible to have an ecologically, an ecology oriented way of cooking. And then uh, it's also about sharing and about community and about social because you cook, but then uh, you also eat together. So it's also an event. Uh, maybe some people will not call it art, uh, but Irene is really an artist and that's what she do. And uh, then, uh, um, we want to speak, go with also this wheel of life, uh, which is also is with the wheel of life I will show you, uh, which comes from Asian philosophy. And uh, at the end, I also will show you how we can link our work with uh, Chinese state philosophy. I have a big interest and I'm very grateful to Su Susanne Weigelin, who is the professor for sinology here for the theoretical part. Uh, that she can present to us, that she can share, show me these uh, elements that link China with Europe. So next slide, please. Yeah, um, so why the avant-garde filmmaking institution. Um, and I think uh, in, if we want to find new solutions for the questions, for the problems, but also new insights, but also new ideas for the future, uh, thinking out of the box is what we do uh, when we have artists looking into this questions. And I don't like to speak problems, but yes, of course, we have a lot of questions, uh, but thinking out of the box uh, is helping to find ways that are not so usual. So uh, by thinking out of the box and relating our scientific work and also our participatory work uh, to art uh, uh, gives a place where we can create visions and hopes and also where we can have people experience, yes, it's possible to change the status quo. We don't need fire that is maybe going into, into the air and uh, we can use the solar energy even in a very small and simple way uh, so that uh, uh, the adults and the children in the park understand, yes, there are different ways. And in that way, uh, we give people events, uh, the, the persons who come to see us or to work with us or to play with us or to look with us, uh, they will have an experience. And that of course is emotionally very important. I hope uh, you can now show what uh, this uh, square is uh, announcing. I think this was the thing where the video was not- Yeah, there. Ah, this video is not, no, the video is the not working, one. sorry. So we go to the theoretical thing. No, the one before, please. The theory, this one that says uh, the theory. One slide back. Yeah. yeah. So um, we, together with Bettina Kolb, as you can see, we have published a lot of it. And uh, we think that uh, it is very important that we are not just individuals uh, who work together. And yes, we need good architects. And we have Richard S. Levine, who is an architect who also for 30 years is working on urban development from an architectural point of view. Um, uh, but it's important that the person who lives in the town considers uh, this his or her town. And 
uh, as my slide is saying, uh, you need you need to, to create usage, and I don't like the term usage, uh, but uh, you need to create uh, situations where people can exper actually experience the quality of the town in which they are living or in which uh, a good home is presenting uh, a way of having a good and sustainability oriented life in a place. And, uh, uh, of course, it's a lot uh, also about public space. Do the cities have public space? In Austria, we're very happy. In Vienna, at least, we are very happy to have a lot of public uh, and green spaces. Uh, and uh, the, it's important uh, with all these art events that Eukodom is organizing, uh, for instance, with the solar cooking, uh, and then then uh, people can identify and have a place. And when they pass by the same place where we have been doing this work, they can remember and emotionally relate uh, to this idea of, yes, sharing, being together, but also for the technical part, which is important too. So it's really, uh, it's really both. And then uh, it's not an abstract kind of knowledge. So we said that we release the space from abstraction. It's not an abstract just space. It's my place, my uh, garden, my park, my field. So in that sense, and of course it's not my, it's co-ownership. So it's our common ownership um, that uh, we would like to enjoy, but that we also would like to maintain. And uh, we have a lot of uh, different people who work with us in that sense. Uh, we make uh, a little island, for instance, uh, with a person who brought a lot of uh, beautiful African tissues with all these beautiful colors. So we bring Africa into uh, the small uh, town in Vienna, then the small garden in Vienna, uh, to show that also this idea that it's always a worldwide question about sustainability. We need uh, to have all these links. And uh, the other, th we have many thesis, but uh, the, the other thesis that fits to this idea of having uh, artificial and art events in the public space is the theory uh, that the city is a stage, a stage. It's not a theater, but yes, everybody, me, I, even if you think of yourself, let's say you go through Vienna and you go on Stephansplatz, you behave differently. It's a stage for you. You behave very differently whether you are in a highly um, sophisticated area like Stephansplatz or Kärntnerstraße, and you behave differently when you are in the flea market. Uh, so uh, in a big town, like oh, not that big, but yes, rather big town, uh, everybody and your group uh, can choose uh, uh, what kind of a stage uh, you feel like. So it's a lot about emotion, which uh, in uh, social research is not so often used, but it's a lot about emotion. So which emotion would uh, tell you that today is uh, a, a day for the flea market and which emotional situation uh, would uh, tell you, no, 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 today I really want to be in a highly complicated situation. But sometimes you would also like to go to a place which is uh, not so important. Next, please. And uh, yeah, maybe you show immediately, okay. Uh, so these are the, the principles, but maybe you can show the, the image. Next image, please. <coughs> yes. So I fortunately have a very good partner. She did not put her name on it. It's Michelle Prem, and I'm very grateful to her. So uh, as I said, we are working uh, with an architect who is sustainability oriented, Mr. Levine. Uh, and uh, he has already developed uh, a very famous uh, research project uh, together with Alcodrome uh, for Vienna, for the Westbahnhof. He thinks in big structures, but he makes them accessible and not uh, high-rise high buildings, uh, but buildings that offer also a lot of public space uh, and who offer space where people can meet. Uh, so uh, together with uh, Michelle, uh, we have uh, tried to say, you see a vertical cut through this implantation. 
And uh, we and this uh, we have developed this in Kyrigan with all these people from so many different uh, lifestyles and countries. And here we uh, show, uh, and there's also a big need uh, in uh, Kyrigan, which Mohammed, uh, one of these people that we interviewed, uh, pointed out, which is that especially for the women, uh, it is very difficult uh, to live in this situation in Kyrigan, where their husbands are often uh, deceived. They were hoping to have a wonderful life and now it's so difficult to, to gain even the money to, for living. So um, uh, it's, uh, and women are even less, even if they come from an Arabic background, uh, uh, they have less chances to be economically independent. So he was insisting uh, that we should say, yes, these women have a very high knowledge uh, that they, they have in private, uh, but why not make them professional? So uh, we, and actually we had also people in Kyrgyzstan, which we had interviewed. There was, for instance, an African woman. And when we first went to our interviews, uh, she was making clothes uh, in a very small little shop. And uh, one year later, uh, she uh, was already uh, leading a kitchen and selling uh, a restaurant uh, and uh, having clients that come to this restaurant. So she had actually managed to be, and she was alone, she actually had managed to be um, self-independent uh, and, uh, and make her own life. And now she's already teaching others how to cook. So in this, uh, in this uh, simplification that you see, you see that there's a restaurant and there could be, uh, and in the interior places, uh, the restaurant could be on, a, on the terrace that Dick Levine has designed. Uh, but inside, uh, you can uh, have a lot of uh, business training for how to cook, but they can also learn uh, how to serve at a restaurant. So that can be a basis for a future economic basis for the life, which is based on what they know already. So it's not that they have to start from zero. They already know how to cook. It's just that they should have a possibility to become more professional. And on the roof, uh, which uh, in this uh, Sin City idea for the, for the abattoir, uh, on the roof, uh, one could have urban gardening. So you could also have classes where people learn how to make this urban gardening, which is certainly part of a sustainability oriented lifestyle. And then they, this, uh, this uh, thing that you harvest on the roof goes down into the kitchen and from the kitchen to the restaurant. So you have a lot of different, uh, of different professions uh, that such uh, uh, a symptopia uh, can fulfill. And uh, we also, we always start somehow from reality. Yes, it's imagining a good future, but also do we find examples in the world of today? And uh, we found out that in Austria, as well is, as uh, in Kyrgyzstan, in Brussels, that there's an institution that is called Repair and Service Center. And it was founded 30 years ago, just like Eukodrom. Uh, and they decided that waste should not exist. So uh, they, they are an economically wealthy institution uh, where people, where they collect uh, what where you can call, I have uh, that or this machinery that doesn't work, please come and get it. So they come to your house, they take the machinery to their center and there they repair it. So there too, they are teaching people how to repair something. You can repair your washing machine or whatever and you can learn how to do that. And in this implantation, you have, uh, as you see, you have the delivery where Ruth and others of course can bring the things. Then you have places uh, that have no light, which an architect hates because uh, places without light are not so great. But if it's this repair center, then of course you can, uh, this is the place where you can save uh, the things that are not working and we can also save that once you have repaired them, you can also have a place where, the play, where these uh, repaired objects uh, uh, stay safe. And then you can take the elevator down and you have the delivery. So um, we just uh, speak about something like uh, circular economy. And uh, 
Uh, you also have an outside, as you see, you have the tree that uh, we put there. So that is certainly also part of a good life in a town uh, that you have a lot of uh, decent amount of green around you. And that uh, can be a place uh, for use, for dancing, for events, and also for lectures and for artistic events. So this, uh, this can be a place, even with Corona, if it's in open air, uh, you can uh, imagine how to fill this place uh, with life. And that is the question. It's always about how to make uh, life and to have a, sustain a sustainable way of treating nature and people. And it's also about education and also about learning uh, oriented towards a sustainable future. And uh, it's, cre it's creating new possibilities like recycling as a new concept for work. We found out that also in Belgium, there's a similar thing like in Austria, but that, uh, that but it's not enough. Uh, you could certainly multiply this approach. And uh, it's also the space for art and uh, even art uh, is certainly also uh, contributing to um, your own, uh, main, maintaining your own, own life. And that uh, is especially important in a place like Kyrgyzstan, uh, where people really sometimes live from nearly nothing. So we, we show how something like a syntopia, a place, and this concentration of a place, uh, I don't like the term school because I don't uh, really like the schooling. Uh, but yes, of course, it's learning and uh, it's, it's places and activities where you can learn things. So the next slide, please. And I hope that we can also see a film now. Next slide, please. Yes. So uh, this is a, uh, a film made by uh, three artists, uh, amongst which Ganael uh, is the youngest one, I think, and he's studying art and filmmaking. And uh, he uh, realized uh, that I said in the beginning that uh, we have also problems like the beetle. Um, and this beetle has destroyed uh, kilometers and kilometers of forests uh, in Czechia uh, and what is uh, uh, and also in Austria in Allensteig. So um, uh, here too this emotional uh, emotional co-ownership theories uh, can be applied uh, because one of the three people who made this film, uh, Mr. Mr. Eichler, uh, he, um, his grandfather is living in uh, the place in Czechia. He has been living there for 30 years. Uh, and as you can see in the video, there are five kilo, it is in five kilometers from the sand have been uh, destroyed uh, in, uh, in, what's the name? I, I have not been there, in Yashinsky. So uh, they had to te tear down like five kilometers of, of, of square, I don't know, I cannot count. So square kilometers with a radius of five kilometer uh, where these beetles have destroyed the, uh, the wood. Uh, and uh, then uh, we think uh, humans tend to see the enemy in the, in the beetle. But of course, it's not the beetle who is the enemy. Uh, the film even shows the beetle as a sympathetic uh, animal, which it is. Uh, it's just uh, the habits of humans who are not thinking about the natural context. So it's not the beetle, which is, uh, yeah. And this was a film that was also sponsored. So maybe we can now have, a, have an insight into the film that uh, I would like to present you. Ah, no, that's, uh, no, that's another film, but yeah, okay. So maybe I'll give you the intro. No, okay. That's the next film. But wh where is the Boot and Parasit film then? The da war kein Link dabei. Da war kein Link. Da war kein Link. Uh -huh. Aber man kann sie, zum Glück ist der Name da. Aber yeah. Man... Uh, that's really a pity. And this one comes as next. So maybe we can look into the film. That you... uh, was is that? Martin Google film gerade. Aha. Vielleicht finde er dann schnell. 
Nein, der, das ist ja ein Experiment, den gibt es noch nicht, das Film. Ah, okay. Uh, so this film is not yet uh, on screen, but we can go to the next film, uh, um, which, uh, which I have been participating to. Because the other film, and uh, if you are interested, we can send you the link. Uh, I don't know why the, the technology is not working here, which is really a shame. Um, and you saw also in the first image for my presentation uh, that they really have an artistic approach. Uh, the thinking out of the box uh, is certainly one thing they also to present. Okay, let's go to the next film where you saw already the beginning. Yeah, here you see a film uh, that uh, comes yeah, please let, let just do it and I give the explanation afterwards. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah, this film is also an animation film uh, uh, where Buddy Mink, who is really an avant-garde artist, uh, so she combines uh, reality like the Erzberg, which is also a man's work. And then she also looks uh, in uh, postcards and she looks at the back of it and uh, finds uh, so very special. And here you see he is very sad. Uh, but uh, they uh, for the film they were actually cooking this Erzberg so that they have a real Berg uh, in the kitchen and we were eating the, the Berg at the end of the day. And uh, it's always about culture and landscape and how to combine those. And with that film we actually managed to get uh, to the big film festival in uh, Saint Tropez. Mm -hmm. So um, uh, it shows that uh, yes, uh, art and research uh, is well working together in case you find people like Buddy and myself uh, who have not only a friendship but also a common understanding for the future of humanity and nature which and of course there is this relationship nature humanity and uh, that's uh, it was a great success and it still is and I suppose you can even we even show it quite often it's a real professional film so you need a cinema to show it okay so the next one uh, with Tuf Qigong next one please no we need Tuf Qigong so the next one is the film, uh, yeah, that was Ganael's film, and then, yeah, here. So um, I'm also referring to Chinese, uh, to Chinese um, habits, let's say, uh, and uh, also uh, with Taoist um, approaches, I'm doing that myself, and uh, you can see that uh, in China, they do not hesitate uh, to have uh, also a monk as an example. Uh, so it's movements that uh, I do every evening uh, and uh, it's very good for your qi. As you know, uh, or some of you may know, qi is the life of quality in, uh, in a Chinese context. So it's important for Chinese people and also for myself uh, to do this exercise every day because it really uh, supports the life, uh, the life quality and the life, uh, yeah, the chi. Not translatable. We have one. We have one more. We have one more artist to show. 
please, let's go to the next one. And the next one is an artist who lives in Vienna. So we are international, yes, but we are also looked some, looking somehow to, yes. And this is Irene Lukas. Um, in many uh, projects that Orchidrome is organizing, we have this kind of uh, element uh, where people on the one hand can see new technology. Irene Lukas and her team, they are collecting uh, from the roofs uh, these old solar panels that previously were used for TV, uh, for the TV. And now, uh, as you can see, there are the participants in, in the project uh, on the middle uh, photo. Uh, you, they put glass on these, uh, on these panels. And with that, you can catch uh, the sun energy and then you can be cooking. And here you see that we did that in a park in Vienna, in Novihof, in Agora, in a big project Agora, uh, where we had several of these elements and we occupied a whole park. And one of the park, we played uh, a game over Rome, uh, where people had a map of town and they had elements like stones, like shach, like, like shach, where they could put what their wishes on a map. And then uh, they had a discussion among maybe 10 people uh, how to find a common view about how, about how to use uh, the places in, uh, in a town. Next slide, please. Yeah, next slide, please. Yes. So this is uh, also a, uh, a combination of Eastern, uh, Far East knowledge and the European, let's say, knowledge. And uh, in this, uh, with this project, uh, Oikodrom went uh, to Juju in Romania because I have also a very big link to Romania, not only to China. Uh, and as you can see, um, uh, you have this uh, endless, uh, this eight, which represents the endless and eternity. But here we had, uh, for instance, students walk in, as you can see on the left uh, photo, you can see that it's people who are going in this eight. And, uh, and it's somehow endless. You can go on and on and on. Uh, but uh, our Taoist uh, coordinator of this game uh, made also a sort of dance out of it. So it's something like dancing, which is also uh, an important human activity. Also, of course, uh, you can think of uh, insects that they are dancing, uh, but for human, it's really a human activity. So uh, he made uh, them uh, have a rhythm. Uh, so for instance, only one from each direction, they had different groups. And they had to consider whether they would not uh, get into one another and have a peaceful walking around uh, in uh, this eight. And uh, we did that also in a place, uh, in a school for handicapped people. And uh, so um, for handicapped young people. And uh, that was an excellent exercise also for them uh, to let them show themselves and not to be ashamed because they are somehow handicapped. And now we have one more, we have one more slide, please. Um, yes, uh, where, uh, but that is something we prepare for 22. <laughs> uh, and here we want to do this in Vienna, uh, maybe in Florida stuff, which is also a place where people from foreign countries are coming. And here we will make a, a big installation, a pneumatic uh, installation uh, where two people can get in and get in contact and, uh, um, and where they can also discuss how the status quo can be changed, but also how simple it might be in a public space to create uh, a place where people are protected and can look into their own uh, into their own view and share with one person uh, the view outside also. So it's an inside-outside uh, connection. People from outside can see, aha, two people are doing something and uh, the two people inside can also look outside. And now it's really the last slide about uh, China. Uh, and uh, I'm following Professor Weigelin, who is an 
incredible knowledge, knowledgeable about uh, about cyanology, and uh, and she just made uh, also this link, which no one can explain why the hell uh, eight, 700 and 800 before Christ, uh, there are similar uh, movements uh, in Greece with Aristoteles and in, uh, and in China with Kung Tzu and Lao Tzu. And, uh, um, and also in China, uh, we can link uh, this idea of Kung Tzu, Confucius, uh, with uh, nature, because uh, Confucius got his inspiration for his incredibly big philosophical uh, movement, uh, because he went uh, walking on Wanderschaft for 13 years uh, through China to have time and leisure uh, to find out uh, his deep thinking. So, last slide. <laughs> I would like uh, my two uh, partners, Bettina Kolb, with whom I do uh, my research. She is the one who is teaching hermeneutical uh, interpretation of photo interviews, and Beate Schalko, who was very supportive in putting together uh, the, and also to organize my somewhat chaotic uh, thinking into a PowerPoint. So I'm curious to see what uh, you, and I thank you for listening. I think we have to thank you for being with <laughs> us uh, here today so and, like <laughs> okay. and um, bringing all these different practical examples as, as well from different places and very concrete ones yes. because you know often in science it's just these theories that are out there but then really yeah. to hear about um, actual grassroots level projects that yeah. are being practiced in different places and different countries. That's so yeah. I'm very glad what you say, because that is really mm -hmm. our aim. How do we link this highly complicated hermeneutical interpretation mm -hmm. that also comes from Bible studies, where uh, you sit for hours or years just with one sentence, God mm -hmm. created light. What does it mean? And we have the same thing when somebody says, I have a place. Mm -hmm. That's one sentence. And that is mm -hmm. where we developed uh, this idea of an emotion co-ownership. Mm -hmm. I have a place. It's not me, it's we have a place. Have a place. Yeah, so let's see. Are here any questions? I think um, Martin has enabled you all to speak. So if you want to speak or turn off on your cameras, the students, you can do it now, or otherwise, you can just post the question into the chat. Otherwise, in the meantime, while we are waiting, I wrote <laughs> down something. And I was thinking because you talked about this um, emotional co-ownership of the cities and then in your experience when you work in these settlements and the cities around the world, what is, I mean, what, what does or how does a sustainable city look like or what are like the specific ingredients of it? Yeah, that, that's the big question. And uh, of course, there's no sustain, really sustainable city so far. Mm. Uh, so we are looking for elements. Uh, and uh, on the one hand, sure, uh, every park is somehow maybe oriented towards sustainability. Mm. Uh, but uh, we have also produced, uh, I showed you this one sketch uh, for Syntopia. Mm -hmm. That is part of a huge building where maybe 5,000 people could live and where everything uh, is ecology, ecology oriented. And uh, in Kyrigem, uh, there is the, the last abattoir, the last slaughterhouse in the whole of Europe is still in town, mm -hmm. uh, which is part of this Kyrigem uh, that I described. And they uh, already made a very, and of course that is a quite a big dimension, the slaughterhouse is huge. Mm -hmm. And uh, the slaughterhouse has a roof that is uh, cultural heritage protected, so they cannot uh, destroy it because and it's also very big. It is the old roof of the slaughterhouse and of the market. Uh, but next to that, they already built also a very big uh, building um, where they already applied that that was built 15 years ago. 
uh, and they applied uh, what then was the best of sustainability oriented architecture. Mm -hmm. And in the project now, um, this partner of ours, Richard Levin, who has done the Westbahnhof, so it's somehow this uh, dimension, like, mm -hmm. like overpowering the whole region of Westbahn, not only Westbahnhof, mm -hmm. where, but between the two streets. So, mm -hmm. so over the, the idea was to overbuild all the trail yards, so you would not, it was also practically it could have been practical, but unfortunately, the vice mayor uh, who had given us the task uh, was moved out because he was too innovative. So he went up to Europe and got a very big job in Europe. Okay. So we could not do it. But now we did it for this abattoir side. Mm -hmm. And uh, there is a video that is 40 minutes long. And we showed it, we, we showed it to one of to the main architect of the abattoir mm -hmm. who liked it very much. Uh, but also the owner. This is a family business for the third, third uh, generation already. And uh, now, next week, uh, the, this Elke will also look at the mm -hmm. video. And uh, it seems that she got very good news because she's very interested that we organize a new vision of this uh, place. Oh, so, I think there is also a question yes, here. Please. Uh, from Tikla, she has asked, has COVID, especially the lockdowns, created a change in how you design and think of future projects? Has COVID changed how current projects are accepted by the public? Yeah, that's a very good question and uh, there's not yet an answer, but uh, I think um, all this, uh, this basic idea that you create places where people can meet, that uh, is right now not uh, possible, uh, but uh, the visions of people for the future uh, would certainly go into places where, yes, we can meet. I think everybody has become aware of the fact how sad it is uh, that we are all enclosed. Mm. So if we would actually think of an, if we are not optimistic, if we think that COVID stays, then that would mean that we have to think about, I, I don't know how to think about places where you could actually move mm -hmm. and meet, uh, but uh, the, the, the desire for places where you can meet has certainly been growing a lot. And I can see this Daiji, for instance, in Vienna, now people meet in Burggarten to do Daiji. Mm -hmm. And uh, these places uh, will probably uh, get a new dimension. And uh, I know that many people are now going to Burggarten or also in the Garden of Schönbrunn. Uh, we can see that they have now, it's they somehow the extended apartment now. Mm. So we can think about uh, the green places as uh, an extended apartment. Uh, and that is something that might become even more desirable into the future that the green places, uh, I, I, of course, we all hope that Corona will not st stay, mm. uh, but it was a sign that uh, like Vienna with its many gardens is a place where people know what to do in their free time mm. instead of just sitting alone at home. Mm. And it's people who meet without knowing each other. Mm -hmm. And uh, we can see that uh, there's obviously a lot of, quite a, number, quite a number of people are already doing Tai Chi, and uh, I'm, I myself, but we cannot do it in the studio. Mm. So we now go to green places and do it there. Mm. And that gives a very strange kind of intimacy and non-intimacy mm. at, at the same time. Are people stopping and watching? Or yeah, are... yeah, yeah. They come and ask, uh, aha, what is it? And things like that, yes. So it's like uh, re-owning the public space. Re-owning <laughs> the public space, exactly. There's a movement of re-owning the mm. public space. Yes. That's good can see that the time is running and Martin, yes, I, I also, think I'll give over to you. Yeah, I also very much liked your talk. Thank you very much. I, you have seen that I had somehow technical problems. It took me like forever to move from one slide to another. And I think you were all five seconds back. I don't know. <laughs> I'm sorry for this technical inconveniences. I also have a, a very short question. You mentioned this one architectural design where yes. like urban farming, kitchen, restaurants are combined. Is this yes. already, in, is this still in a planning stage or is this already implemented at several places? No, it's not implemented, unfortunately, but I have uh, the, the wooden model for it. 
And now, unfortunately, as you know, it's IKEA who is building a big part, not, not very big, much smaller than what we would have planned. Uh, so it would still be possible to do it, but because it's still an empty place. So the value of uh, the rail yard is zero. And uh, that is why the, it might still, if we find uh, someone in the city government or someone who is promoting this idea, uh, then it's still possible. You cannot do it on a very valuable ground, that's obvious. So uh, the one idea from the abattoir in, uh, in, uh, in Kyrgyzstan, in Brussels, it's also a not very valuable place because you are not allowed to build high rise and things like that. So uh, there is some practicability maybe. And maybe this is why the abattoir owners uh, are now so interested to see the video that uh, is nearly ready and next week they will see it. So, uh, but you certainly need on the one hand, uh, an owner of a space, uh, and it must be a big space if you want to do a big thing. Uh, but you also need to find someone who dares uh, going into such a huge, who has the experience to be a builder. So it's also the builder that is uh, necessary. So in case some of my listeners know a big builder who would be able to undertake something like that, uh, we are very happy. So we have a lot to show. Uh, from next week on, we can really show a lot. And it would be something, not a paradise, but uh, it, it would be a place where a lot of our ecology, economy, and sustainability ideas uh, might find a place big enough to, to take attention from many people, not just one house. That would be the idea of it. And of course, you also need a lot of people who live there and to sync with you. So we would also have to develop uh, uh, participatory co-design uh, methodologies, which I'm not so sure whether they exist. I mean, I know a lot of co-design projects in Vienna too, and some of my friends are living in them, secondly, especially in the second district. Uh, but for such a big project, one would need uh, also a methodology to have the co-design done. So it's in two directions that one has would have to develop ideas and base it on what people know already. I think, yes. Martin, you can continue from yeah. here. Yeah, thank you very much. It sounds very promising. I'm already looking forward to see these kind of buildings and to have these integrated ideas. In okay, this go and look for someone. Great. Yes. <laughs> we will, through our climate walk channels, try to make a little advertisement and, and search yeah. for someone. Okay, um, on this note, um, we are almost at the end, so to say, um, as I've told you in the very beginning, the last lecture, actually, you know, we always have four lectures. This time we have three lectures and the actual fourth lecture, that's a little unconventional in so far as, as our guest speakers are not there currently. They have pre-recorded it. Um, and they had to do this because they are right now on their way to Slovenia and they sent you their very warm greetings uh, and 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 are looking forward to meet you also personally at some point or personally, whatever, whatever if, if this is personally. And um, so how will this whole pre-recorded thing work out? We will now, after having introduced uh, a little bit more extensively our guest speakers, which are not immediately here, but you will, you will get to know them through the video. Um, I will post a link into the chat. And with this link, you can get to the, to the cloud video. It should be accessible um, for everyone. So I will do this right now. And then please just stay a little bit more with me. This is the link. Please also tr save this link. You will also find the link on our Moodle page. You will find it on our homepage at some point. And we will also try to merge the recording of this session with the pre-recorded session and to make one YouTube video out of it. So, you have, so to, for you to have the whole experience of, of one um, movie, so to say. Um, we have decided not to screen share the whole thing. Um, as you have all, all already already um, realized that it's a little difficult to you know um, show your whole movie through screen sharing it wouldn't work out uh, too well so you should um, watch it of course voluntarily watch it on your own you can watch it right now of course you can also watch it uh, in the days to come and also if you have questions and comments please put them either into a forum that we have uh, installed in the, on the Moodle platform or directly 
directly send them to the two speakers. They are really um, looking forward to all your questions. I will also put um, um, the, their email address in it. It's, um, please also save this one and we'll also circulate um, the email um, address afterwards. And on that note, I will basically introduce our two speakers. What I have done so far is that I have um, chosen a little picture. I will share this actually. That is how the two look like or would have looked like if they were if they would have joined us through Zoom. Zoom that the one is uh, Christina Sonvela and the other is Mark Graf. And I will um, quickly introduce them. Uh, Mark Graf and Christina Sonvela are photographers and filmmakers who pursue a work focus on wildlife and species conservation stories. They consider themselves as visual storytellers who give back a voice to nature. In total, Mark and Christine have both involved in communication conservation matters for more than 10 years. Both Mark and Christine hold a degree in conservation ecology, obtained at the University of Vienna and University of Melbourne, Australia as well as at Marquerie University, University of Queensland, Australia. Um, Christine also holds a degree in German literature, and besides being a photographer and filmmaker, she also works as a professional writer. Their work has been internationally recognized and awarded multiple times, so they've won several awards. I, I don't want to um, name all of them, but very prestigious one. And, and the work has also been published by local as well as international press and magazines, such as National Geographic magazine, Terra Mata, Terra Sauvage, or BBC Wildlife magazine. So, they far, so far, they have published more than 250 articles, amongst them many cover stories. Uh, photography and film assignments have been carried out for the Slovenian Tourism Board, Diverse Austrian National Parks, or the Austrian Ministry of Environment. As videographers and co-directors, Mark and Christine also contribute to TV nature documentaries and stream through OIF, ATE, ZDF. And since 2015, they've been intensively working on documenting and learning more about big predators in Central Europe. And the session that you will, will, you will be able to watch is basically about visual storytelling in the context of these big predators coming back um, again to Central Europe. Um, the project Leben am Limit, Living on the Edge, has grown into a successful initiative that partners with nature organizations such as Rewilding Europe, uh, yeah, Christine's and Mark ambition is all about raising acceptance for and soundly informing the public about bears, lynxes, and wolves. So uh, those are actually our two virtual um, um, guest speakers that you can then um, watch through the link I have just put into the chat. It's a uCloud link. Uh, you can access it at any time, and you can also download it um, to later watch it at some point. Um, it's, it's a very, very nice work they have done, and it's very much also tying into with what we have heard today when it comes to visual storytelling. And what they too, uh, do is basically they use visual storytelling for sending a message that it's important to have big predators such as bears, wolves, and lynxes, lynxes uh, in, in Europe again. And that also these as somehow keystone species fulfill very important functions actually for, for intact ecosystems. And by that also, this is again, of course, linked to climate change uh, and, and also to, um, to having um, healthy um, and, and biodiverse ecosystems. Um, on that note, basically you have the, the email address. It's also in the chat office at sonvia.at. And then you also have the link. Please watch it. Please um, send them your regards, send them emails, send them comments. They're really looking forward to it. Um, and, 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 Yes, so that's it from my side. Basically, um, please watch the video at some point whenever you want to do it. Um, and on that note, I will hand back over to Ria. Thank you very much for joining us today. Have a nice evening and, and see you soon. Thanks, Martin. So before I say the very ending words, we have one pressing question over here uh, from Heidi. Uh, should we ask? We just saw that there are some Chinese signs of someone who is attending. So um, if that person is here, are you from China or maybe you want to write something in the chat box or say? 
Okay, so that goes out to the person with the Chinese name here in our um, uh, lecture today. But so I just want to say again, thank you for all the contributions of the lecturers that we had today. I think it was a great session and at least I myself learned a lot of new things, especially how art can bring us closer to understand climate change. Um, and I can also really actually recommend watching that uh, video that Martin just advertised. I had um, a glimpse uh, through it and it has great visuals there. And hmm. so we see each other in two weeks again. So next Thursday, there is no lecture. The next lecture will be on the 6th of May. And then we look at different ways of communicating climate change and socio-ecological transformation with guests. Um, I have here some names. We have Andreas Sherlovsky, Gabriel Banauch, Ulrich Brandt, mm -hmm. Camilo Moreno, mm -hmm. and Manuel Grebenjansch. So uh, we will also have a... Um, um, a panel discussion coming up in two weeks and two lectures so we hope that you will all join us then again so for now stay healthy stay safe keep on going for walks and goodbye and do tai chi in parks yeah do tai chi in the viennese parks <laughs> okay bye Der ist ja, auch schon da. Wer ist das? Der Martin? Das ist der Martin, genau. Wer ist das? Das ist der Martin, der jetzt gemeint.